The majority decision, in my considered opinion, has not only done short shrift to the governing terms of the Constitution, but also failed to adhere to the clear path of the law which has evolved, including this court precedents on electoral law. Just as with the Constitution itself, so with the regulatory sets of norms, including the statutes and regulations, they all fall to the interpretive mandate of the courts. These facts, on the plane of legal scholarship, ought to be apprehended as the inherent common law chain that runs through the motions of judicialism in Kenya, as in so many other countries of the common law world. The long established rationales of the judicial method remain with us today, and they ordain the espousal of the doctrine of precedent, a universal concept which indeed is expressly replicated in the Constitution of Kenya, 2010. Thus, this Constitution stipulates Article 1637, all courts other than the Supreme Court are bound by the decisions of the Supreme Court. The Constitution prescribes competence in common law principles as prerequisite in the appointment of judges. In the following terms, Article 166.2, each judge, quote, each judge of a superior court shall be appointed from among persons who hold a law degree from a recognized university or are advocates of the High Court of Kenya or possess an equivalent qualification in a common law jurisdiction, end of quote. The common law interpretive method is the constant milieu within which the application of Kenya's electoral law, beginning from the Constitution to the subsidiary legislation, is to be apprehended. Once the judge accomplishes the task of interpreting the electoral law as provided in the Constitution, the judge comes down to a whole set of statutes and regulations, the latter category comprising the Supreme Court Act, Appellate Jurisdiction Act, the Elections Act, the Election Campaign Financing Act, the Election Offenses Act, the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission Act, the Political Parties Act. How has the court interpreted such laws? Where is the Supreme Court's earlier work recorded in that regard? And since the applicable law is a pertinent one for each electoral dispute. What is the current state of the law? How does such law apply in relation to a petition before the Supreme Court in relation to the general election of 8th August 2017? Does such law affect the presidential election of that date differently from the manner in which it affects the other five sets of elections of the same date? Case law, the law as interpreted and applied by judges on the recorded merits of each matter, has forever been the cornerstone of the common law. It is precisely the common law's focused and authentic appraisal of the facts of each case that made it ever so compelling as a defining strand in the judicial contribution to progressive, modern, governance in conditions of democracy. Jurisprudential confirmation for the foregoing standpoint is found in the work of a distinguished justice of the Supreme Court of the United States of America, Benjamin Nathan Cardozo, 1870 to 1938, in his book, The Nature of the Judicial Process. And he says, from page 28 to 31, quote, the problem which confronts the judge is a twofold one. He must first extract the precedents, the underlying He must first extract from the precedents the underlying principle, the ratio decidendi, 
he must then determine the path or direction along which the principal is to move and develop. Cases do not unfold their principles for the asking. They yield their kernel slowly and painfully. The directive force of a principal may be exerted along the line of logical progression. This I will call the rule of analogy or the method of philosophy. Along the line of historical development, this I will call the method of evolution. Along the line of the customs of the community, this I will call the method of tradition. Along the line of justice, morals, and social welfare, the mores of the day, and this I will call the method of sociology." End of quote. Such challenges of adjudication dictate that the gains of the past, authoritative Interpret interpretation by a discerning and responsible court be perceived as representing a precious juristic civilization. And these are for keeps as a reference point for the conscientious and effective resolution of later disputes. Now the judicial approach in the sphere of electoral law is obviously inseparable from the Constitution's values and principles of democracy. It thus behoves us to pay due deference to the fundamentals of the sets of cases that have in the last several years been determined by this Supreme Court on the subject of elections, including presidential elections. Such is quite conclusively the most dependable course of the law that this country's lawyers must engage in the first place. In Raila Odinga and others against Ahmed Isaac Hassan, petition number five of 2013, this court took into account the nature of the governance mandate under the Constitution and in response to a challenge to the integrity of the presidential election, laid down a set of guiding parameters. The court said as follows, quote, an alleged breach of an electoral law which leads to a perceived loss by a candidate takes different considerations. The office of president is a focal point of political leadership and therefore a critical constitutional office. This office is one of the main offices which in a democratic system are constituted strictly on the basis of majoritarian expression. The whole national population has a clear interest in the occupancy of this office, which indeed they themselves renew from time to time through the popular vote, end of quote, flowing from the crucial majoritarian factor in the filling of the primary office of the executive branch the court in that case defined its orientation as regards the resolution of an electoral dispute, such as the one which has now come up before us. Quote, as a basic principle, it should not be for the court to determine who comes to occupy the presidential office. Save that this court, as the ultimate judicial forum entrusted under the Supreme Court Act, 2011, with the obligation to assert the supremacy of the Constitution and the sovereignty of the people of Kenya, must safeguard the electoral process and ensure that individuals accede to power in the presidential office only in compliance with the law regarding elections." End of quote. The foregoing principle in this Supreme Court's perception dictated that even though the court must uphold the clear popular electoral mandate, it will hold in reserve the authority, legitimacy, and readiness to pronounce on the invalidity of the occupancy of the presidential office in case there is any major breach of electoral law." End of quote. The foregoing point regarding the Supreme Court's obligation of vigilance is, is expressed still further in another paragraph. Quote, the judiciary in general, and this Supreme Court in particular, has a central role in the protection of the Constitution and the realization of its fruits. 
So this may inure to all within our borders. And in the exercise of that role, we choose to keep our latitude of judicial authority unclogged. So the Supreme Court may be trusted to have a watchful eye over the play of the Constitution in the fullest sense, even as we think it right that this court should not be a limiting factor to the enjoyment of free political choices by the people, we hold ourselves ready to address and to resolve any grievances which flow from any breach of the Constitution and the laws enforced under its umbrella. End of quote. Such guiding principles were clear enough and, in my perception, were attended with special merit. These principles today represent the vital backdrop to Kenya's electoral law. In the foregoing case, this court, Suomoto, undertook a sample retaliating of votes, coming to the conclusion that, quote, by no means can the conduct of this election be said to have been perfect, even though, quite clearly, the election had been of the greatest interest to the Kenyan people and they had voluntarily, voluntarily come out in the polling station, to the polling stations, for the purpose of electing the occupant of the presidential office. End of quote. The court, while being mindful of the several imperfections noted during the sample retaliating, mainly directed its mind to the emerging majoritarian intent asking itself the following question before upholding the election outcome in that case. Quote, did the petitioner clearly and decisively show the conduct of the election to have been so devoid of merits and so distorted as not to reflect the expression of the people's electoral intent? It is this broad test that should guide us in this kind of case in deciding whether we should disturb the outcome of the presidential election, end of quote. The precedent-setting decision was distinctly endorsed by subsequent electoral dispute cases, and it must now be regarded as the pillar of the scheme of electoral law in Kenya, founded upon a beneficent interpretation of the Constitution and of the whole body of electoral law. This point, for good measure, is consistent with the comparative adjudicatory experience in election matters. As the retired Israeli Justice of the Supreme Court, Aharon Barak, in his book, The Judge in a Democracy, observes, quote, comparative law can help judges determine the objective purpose of a constitution. Democratic countries have several fundamental principles in common. As such, legal institutions often fulfill similar functions across countries. From, from the purpose that one given democratic legal system attributes to a constitutional arrangement, one can learn about the purpose of that constitutional arrangement in another legal system. Indeed, comparative constitutional law is a good source of expanded horizons and cross-fertilization of ideas across legal systems." End of quote. On such a basis of principle, the law and practice in the United Kingdom of Great Britain may be cited for its relevance in the instant case. A nap summary of that position was made by a distinguished scholar, Stanley Alexander D. Smith, who was Downing Professor of the Laws of England in the University of Cambridge, in his book, Constitutional and Administrative Law, third edition, 1977, page 252. And he says, quote, Petitions based on irregularities at elections are now extremely rare. This is partly because very close contests are uncommon. 
And even if the court finds that irregularities were present, it may determine that the results ought to stand, since they were unlikely to have affected the results. End of quote. Such a state of the law is reflected in yet another decision of this Supreme Court, Munya against Kithinji and two others, Supreme Court petition number 2B of 2014. And this is what we said in this court. Quote, if it should be shown that an election was conducted substantially in accordance with the principles of the Constitution and the Elections Act, then such election is not to be invalidated only on the ground of irregularities. Where, however, it is shown that the irregularities were of such a magnitude that they affected the election result, then such an election stands to be invalidated. Otherwise, procedural or administrative irregularities and other errors occasioned by human imperfection are not enough by and of themselves to vitiate an election, end of quote. On the same principle, the Supreme Court thus held in Kidero and four others against YT2 and four others. Supreme Court petition number, 14, number 18 of 2014. Quote, generally, an election can only be declared void if that election did not substantially comply with the written law. In this regard, the Constitution, the Elections Act, and the regulations made there under, and any other relevant law and where there is substantial compliance with the written law in an election, the irregularities must indeed have affected the result of the election for that election to be invalidated." End of quote. Yet another authoritative decision of this court, Obado against Oyugi and two others, Sup Supreme Court Petition Number 4 of 2014, quote, although the Court of Appeal cited the decision of this court in the Rael Udinga case, it did not apply the principle that a court should consider the effect of the irregularity in the contested results. This principle holds that irregularities in the conduct of an election should not lead to annulment where the election substantially complied with the applicable law and the results of the election are unaffected." End of quote. The Supreme Court ever so clearly defined the operative electoral law on the basis of the Raila Odinga petition of 2013 in the subsequent petitions. The court was scrupulously affirming the synchrony of two express edicts of the Constitution of Kenya 2010 in Article 13 and Article 159.1, the first defining the sovereignty of the people, the second delimiting the judicial authority. By Article 13, the people's sovereign power is partly delegated to, quote, the judiciary and independent tribunals, Article 13C, while Article 159.1, which constitutes the judicial authority, says, quote, judicial authority is derived from the people and vests in and shall be exercised by the courts and tribunals established by or under this constitution. The foregoing principle was constantly reflected in the Supreme Court's decisions rendered in 2013 and after, as is exemplified in the case George Mike Wanjohi against Stephen Kariuki and two others, Supreme Court petition number 2A of 2014, where this court said, quote, this court should in principle not substitute a sitting elected representative with another without allowing the people to execute their political rights as enshrined under the Constitution. To do otherwise would be to undermine the values and principles of democratic governance that bind us in the execution of our judicial authority. It would also lead to an upset in the composition of the elected office holders who bear the people's sovereignty and who stand out as a clear dis disregard, as a clear disregard of the founding provisions of the Constitution, end of quote. In hindsight, 
the foregoing passage in my Kwanjohi touches on the very nub of judicial responsibility as it relates to the sovereignty of the people who establish the totality of the current governance system through the Constitution of Kenya 2010. It hence follows that the general guiding path for the disposal of electoral disputes, such as the instant one, could not have been stated more conscientiously and more effectively than it was in that case as follows, quote, by the design of the general principles of the electoral system and of voting in Articles 81 and 86 of the Constitution, it is envisaged that no electoral malpractice or impropriety will occur that impairs the conduct of elections. This is the basis for the public expectation that elections are valid until the contrary is shown, end of quote. A consideration A consideration of the merits of an electoral petition, such as the instant one, therefore, takes one straight back to the evidence tendered. So we get back to evidence. And hence, there is an inseparable link between institutional principle and the pillars of evidence. Since, as I have already determined, the petition herein fails on the pillars of evidence. It becomes clear that the majority decision lacks validity from the standpoint of governing principles. Evidence is the bearer of telltale signs of electoral victory or of electoral defeat. The physical form of the ballot is directly visible and is readily subjected to the test of simplicity, accuracy, verifiability, security, accountability, and transparency. This physical evidence <coughs> quite clearly is the natural starting point in ascertaining who has won an election. And hence, the majority judgment would have been expected to begin from a foundation of numerical assessment before invoking any other parameters. For such other elements are essentially subjective and are, in, and are inherently destined to compromise the sovereign will of the voters which the Constitution expressly safeguards. Only from such a foundation of the physical vote count does one secure a proper viewpoint for the other dimensions of the electoral process, including the credibility of the entire operation. Indeed, in view of the relative strength of the evidence emanating from the two sides, the only objective conclusion would have, would have been that Within the measure of the possible, the conduct of the election by the first respondent was entirely credible. The emerging principle regarding the initiation of claims by way of election petitions is that all proof should commence from the foundation of the physical ascertainment of voting records. All other claims then must revolve around that pillar and must establish that some gross impropriety had affected the electoral process and should lead to its annulment. I am constrained to propose this scheme as a proper agenda for the reform of Kenya's electoral law. Such legal reform would need to institute all appropriate security backups around the physical records and would ensure the establishment of safety nets around 
the votes cast. The instant case has evoked intense national debate involving professionals, politicians, observers, and others. The consequence being a justification in this judgment for a clarification of the implications of judicial intervention in situations that entail the legitimate exercise of the citizens' momentary inclinations on matters of politics and daily exigency. <clears throat> Falling squarely within such a category are the people's legitimate preferences. What is the proper stand for the Supreme Court in such matters? How does the judge's requisite approach relate to the majority decision in the instant petition? My consideration of such issues confirms my position in this dissenting judgment. By Article 160, sub Article 1 of the Constitution is provided, the judiciary, quote, the judiciary shall be subject only to this Constitution and the law and shall not be subject to the control or direction of any person or authority, end of quote. The Constitution while safeguarding the judiciary's adjudicatory space, entrust certain governance spaces to other agencies, primarily the legislature and the executive. And this is the basis for the constitutional principle known as the separation of powers, a principle the validity of which in the Kenyan constitutional order has not ever been seriously contested. The judiciary is a trustee of the people's sovereign power, Article 1, 3, with regard to the interpretation and application of all the terms of the Constitution and of all other law. Clearly, a substantial initiative in the motions of the entire sphere of law, legality, and jurisprudence has been reserved to the courts. As the outer limits of such reserved competence has not been spe specified in express terms, it follows that the frontier areas of such power, at least potentially, admit of conflicting interpretive approaches. But, as already noted earlier, the proper trustee of the boundary delimiting ethics must be the judiciary, an arm of the state which is endowed with the special facility of juristic values, objective criteria of conflict resolution, a placid mean such as facilitates professionalism, justice, and fairness, and the benefit of access to relevant comparative lessons. The judiciary, in the exercise of such an exclusive mandate, ought to enter upon its task by taking into account the uncontestable reserved remits of the other agencies of the state. <clears throat> the people, in exercise of their sovereign power, have expressly delegated some of that power to parliament and the legislative assemblies in county governments, Article 13A, and they have exclusively entrusted some of their sovereign powers to, quote, the national executive and the executive structures in county governments. End of quote. There is no basis for abridging parliament's power and mandate. For the Constitution, <coughs> Article 94.1 prescribes that, quote, the legislative authority of the republic is derived from the people and at the national level is vested in and exercised by parliament, end of quote. Similarly, there is no basis for detracting from the general character of the executive power. Article 1291 prescribes that, quote, the executive authority derives from the people of Kenya and shall be exercised in accordance with this constitution, end of quote. <coughs> Unlike the judiciary, the work orbit of which is lined up with laws, 
principles, and jurisprudential yardsticks. Both the legislature and the executive, in view of their electoral and policy foundations, may quite properly be described as political agencies. They relate to the largest number of Kenyan people in a close and direct proximity. They influence and are influenced by the momentary concerns, which therefore justify the conception and espousal of policy and politics conceived and executed within short time frames. This is in stark contrast with the relationship between the ordinary citizen and the courts of law. And if the courts overlook this reality, it will constitute a groundswell for failure of judicial responses in line with the professional juristic remit. The prolonged history of judicialism in all democratic countries demonstrates that the proper role of the courts has been professional, judicial, and founded upon cardinal principles which draw lines of correctness and propriety in situations of dispute so as to secure a certain optimum level of safeguards for the rights of the citizen. Beyond that level of safeguard and fulfillment, it falls to the political agencies to pursue constantly such policy stance as will satisfy and give fulfillment to the national populace. On these principles of institutional disposition, it follows that it falls not to the court to make undue haste in assuming the, political, the policy and political mantle a stampede is destined not only to disrupt the delicate institutional balances, but to weaken the reliable jurisprudential bedrock, which assures the citizens of an ultimate governance safety net. In the context of the foregoing reasoning, it follows, in my view, that the majority on the instant petition has made a precarious move that is destined to prove detrimental to the dependable setting of relations among essential governance entities to the detriment of the rights and legitimate expectations of the citizen. 